Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are so glad that you're here with us, worshiping with us this morning. I'm going to start calling people out in just a minute now. I already called the pastor out this morning, so I'm not against it. So we are so glad that you decided to join us for worship this morning. It is an exciting day, and I love the noise before, before worship. Now it's time to take a step back and, and let's focus on, focus on the Lord. My name is Richard Smith. I am the pastor of families and students here at the church, and so excited to be here this morning and glad to be a part of this fellowship. Uh, I do want to shout out to uh, uh, Pastor Frederick. I did call him out this morning, the first service, and I deeply apologize for that. But uh, <laughs> we'll have a good time. He has been amazing and been quite the, the mentor to me as we uh, move along and doing things here in the church, and it has been great. We are so excited that um, if you're visiting with us, that you're here with us this morning. And if you have a uh, prayer request or anything, or if you're new, please fill out the little cards in the pews and let us know that you're here so that we can get a chance to contact you and, and uh, let you know that you're welcomed. And we appreciate you being here this morning. If you're visiting with us online, let us know that you're here by a like or uh, ringing in on our Facebook page where we're videoing this. Uh, also, there are links for different things on that feed, so please feel free to use those and let us know that you are a part of our service this morning. I do have several announcements. Um, first of all, mm, this afternoon for children ages five to fifth grade, we're doing a special outreach project, kind of in honor of Earth Day, as well as for our shut-ins. So our young people are gathering together with Miss Renee and Miss Joy, gonna make some pots of flowers and things to take to our shut-ins and some of our folks who don't get out a whole lot. So if, a couple things, if you have a child that age, we want you to come with your child today to kind of help with that process and also to deliver and maybe meet a couple of our, of our folks who don't get out very much. Also too, if you're interested, I'm sure Renee and Joy Finney would love some help delivering what's left over because we've got about, I think we can count about 30 people almost that we're making pots for. So uh, we could use some help in deliveries tomorrow. And so just let Renee or Joy know, um, they would really appreciate that help. Secondly, next Sunday night, we're having family game night. We haven't had enough church family this weekend, so we're gonna do some more. Uh, so next weekend, we're just doing for, uh, family game night, board games, bring some snacks, have some fellowship. There'll be things for the young ones, as well as folks who are more experienced, cards. I know there are a lot of stuff out there. It's at five to 6.30, so if you even don't like driving at night, it'll still be sunshiny by the time we get back. We'd love for you to come. Just come and hang out and have some fellowship. Last night was amazing. We had uh, an event by the welcome team. Shanna did her, her, uh, her, first, uh, her first rodeo here, and uh, we were so excited. Lots of organization and a lot of fellowship, a lot of buzz. It was some great things that happened last night. So thank you so much, Shanna, for that. And thank you for allowing me not to come early and allowing me to go home early. So I, wow, I just loved it. My last announcement this morning is uh, May the 6th is our Rise Against Hunger event. It is a family-oriented event for everyone to come and we pack meals for, uh, for folks who are experiencing natural disasters or if there's some kind of need in, a, in another country or even in our own country, sometimes the meals go there too. We're gonna pack, I think over 5,000, 15,000, 15,000 meals. But that day is not just about packing meals. We're also taking up collections for the food pantry. We'll have barrels out front. We're gonna have a bounce house for children and for families. We're gonna have cornhole out in the grove just to, and hot dogs. I mean, who doesn't like a hot dog after you sit there and work with food for a couple hours, okay? We need you to sign up online and on the Friday announcement uh, that goes out, our newsletter goes out online, there's a link there to sign up. Let us know you're coming. It takes you to the Rise Against Hunger site and it's really easy. It took me two minutes. I could have signed you all up, but you know, um, I just signed up my wife and I. And so we'll go with that. Okay, so we'd love for you to come be a part of that. That's gonna be a big event, we love. And this is a, a great event to invite others to outside of our church. Everybody wants to help somebody else in the world. And I tell you, it's a great hands-on method of doing that. So bring a neighbor, bring a friend. Like I said, we have lots of events. It'll be a lot of fun. All right. Calm it down, right? I got it, bud. Just y'all, just take a, take a pill back there. I got it. I only mess up once. All right. So yes, 
Um, I want to announce our prayer shawl this morning. It's for Linda Brown, who has uh, been a church member here for, for a number of years. Um, she's experiencing some surgery on May the 2nd, and we want her to be covered in our prayers to that surgery. So during our songs, our congregational singing, please come up and put your hands on and say some prayers for Linda, and we will get that to her this week. Her surgery is uh, May the 2nd, so I think it's next Tuesday, something like that. So. Um, please be in prayer for Linda, and uh, we'll talk more about prayer requests and things in a little bit. Happy birthday, Amy. What? Well, just... Wow. <laughs> Everybody wants to be a pastor, that's right. So this morning, um, <clears throat> yes, I was going to give my wife a shout out, which I don't even see her in here. Uh, she is the reason I'm still here. <laughs> on this planet, as well as in this ministry position. Uh, and I owe her so much, and today is her birthday, so uh, just wanna wish her happy birthday, and if she's out skipping church, that's fine. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. birthday. Yeah. We, uh, sometimes we don't get enough acclamation for birthdays and stuff. Like in the first service, uh, a new member, guys getting ready to join, Steve Hudgens, was his birthday was yesterday. And there's lots of birthdays around, but it's important that we celebrate, celebrate as much as we can. And you folks are important. And so anyway, happy birthday, Amy. And, and Mike reminded me that I had to publicly do this. So, there you go. All right, without any more blah from me, I invite you to breathe deeply. Picture in your mind the face of Christ who loves you with all of his life. And I invite you to stand and join me for our call to worship. Call on the Lord who bends low to hear us come. Lift your voices to the Lord who always hears us. Listen, Lord. Hear our voices, sing your praises. <clears throat> Call on the Lord who bends low to hear us. Listen, Lord, we lift our voices to you in praise. Call on the name of the Lord, all people. Listen, Lord, we call on your wonderful name. For you saved us, you raised us, and turned our lives around. Let your name be praised in this congregation. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, Christ is Alive, number 318.
I invite you to be seated. As we come to our time of offering and prayer this morning, I'd like to remind everyone our offering plates are in the back for, for that offering there. And if you're with us online, our uh, offering for you is a uh, clink, a uh, clink, a click. <laughs> it's a click on the, on the feed this morning. And uh, we appreciate all that you all do to support the ministry of this church and the outreach and the things that we do in the community including events like Rise Against Hunger and supporting food pantry and things like that. Your money is, is definitely uh, put to good use, so thank you so much. And this morning, as I think about our offering, beside our offering, like I have a double offering, we've got to give God a lot because God gave us everything, right? So this morning, I've been thinking about being thankful. And a lot of times we're thankful for the big things. We're thankful for, you know, a great breakfast this morning, a great event last night. Those are big things to me. But sometimes what I want to do this week is focus on the little things that we sometimes take for granted. Um, things like indoor plumbing, uh, things like running water, um, things like being able to come and gather in a building in a place like this. This is the, the small things um, that we need to be thankful for. Maybe it's even just the smile from a, a, a child or a good friend. Um, sometimes we just let those things just blow by. But this week, stop and pause and give God thanks for those little things and let it change your whole perspective. So will you join me in prayer this morning, please? Holy, gracious Lord, you are an amazing God. And we, this place and these people come humbly to bow before you that we may be touched by your presence, God that your spirit would fill our hearts with thankfulness this week, with love, with a deeper sense of appreciation for all that we have, and especially those things that we take for granted. Things like electricity, things like being able to go where we want, when we want, things like not being have to struggle for food every moment of the day. Little things, God, that we sometimes forget that you have blessed us so abundantly with. This morning, as we enter a time of prayer, we can easily be overwhelmed by all those who need you in so many ways. But you are God so that you are the one responsible and in charge of those things. We have folks in our congregation that are dealing with cancer, Lord. We have folks that are facing surgery like Linda and others. We have folks who have family issues that are overwhelming to us. And Lord, we need your presence. Some of us are overwhelmed with loneliness and with loss. Lord, you know all of us to the depths of our core. And Lord, we ask that you be with us in all of those pains and all of those sufferings, Lord. Help us to know your peace and your love so that even in the midst of those shadows, God, we know we are yours and we know that we can still love and bless and be a part of the community around us. Some of us may need to let this community surround them and hold them tight. Some of us may need to serve a little bit more. Whatever it is, God, we pray that you would move us and shake us and help us to know within our heart of hearts what it is that we need so that we can be better to serve you in the world around us. God, we thank you for this place you've given us, even for this country, even in the midst of our divisions and all of our stuff we have going on. Lord, may you be the one who unites all of us together. And Lord, one way we do that is by reciting that prayer that Jesus taught us so long ago. May we be united as one voice in one heart as we think and focus on the words of that prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us from the trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand for our doxology? I invite you to be seated. Amen, choir. So our reader this morning is Pastor D. He'll bring our scripture for us this morning. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but Easter is a season of seven weeks leading up to Pentecost. If you think about that, it's about one-seventh of the year. So in a sense, the season of Easter is like one big Sunday. So happy Easter. Happy Easter. 
I invite you to stand as a way of honoring Christ as we read from the gospel, reading from Luke 24, verses 13 through 21. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. But don't get too comfortable. <laughs> At this time, I invite our children ages three to first grade to go with Miss Carolee to Children's Church. And I invite those of you who are able and would like to stand again, we will be seeing our next hymn, uh, 133, Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. and peace to each and every one of you from God the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord it was very exciting night last night and really enjoyed it was already thank Shanna but also her team who brought this together we don't work individually I want to make sure we understand there's a team effort as I said in morning service a lot of things I empathize with Richard up here because we go through all these things, through staff meeting on Tuesday, trying to play the order, and all of a sudden we forget one or two things, but it's a team effort. Charge it to our heads, not to our hearts. <laughs> what a blessing it is to be here as we continue our series. I'm Frederick Bowman, to those on social media and Facebook, and I am so humbly,
proud to serve this congregation. We are praying for all those announcements that are going around the conference this year is where the preachers will announce whether they're leaving or staying. Y'all just have to put up with me another year. <laughs> but we are so proud and pray for those who are going to new pulpits and not a whole lot of movement from my understanding, but we're getting more and more as the conversation goes on. I am glad to be here. And I'm closing out my 23rd year in, as a pastor in a second career and spent three years on conference staff. But there's nothing like the church. Am I right, D? Nothing like the church. Uh, I thought the conference was an experience. I just can imagine what it's like now, so I just pray for them. We're going to continue our series, which is uh, Living After Easter. Uh, the book of Acts is the start of the Disciples really doing the work and the church coming to fruition to do the work that God has commanded them to do. So those of you that are able, if you don't mind standing again, it's a 14 verses, but if you're able, please. In the first book, Theopolis uh, wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. And after his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. And this he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witness in Ju Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? And this Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Ephraim, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to you may be seated. And I'd like to use as a subject this morning, preaching to strangers. Preaching to strangers. Let us pray. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You're the potter and your servant here is the clay. Mow me and make me after thy will while I'm standing. Yield it and still. Now, Lord, the word is yours. The spirit is yours. And we are yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church say amen. Preaching to strangers. Several years ago, a man who some of us know very well is a retired bishop, was head resident at Duke Divinity School by the name of Will Willimon, who wrote many books. Some of them I have in my library, but this particular book, Preaching to strangers. I had the privilege of asking him about this book when he did the commencement exercise in 2011 when I was receiving my doctorate. 
And I was able to catch him and ask the question, what is it so about this book? Because it talks about evangelism, something that we don't like to hear, but yet it's necessary to build God's kingdom. The disciples were being prepared to do evangelism. And as we look at the text, we realize also that Jesus, for the several days, in the 40 days between the ascension and the resurrection, he was a visual sight to a lot of them. They witnessed him. They knew, but they did not know. And even many of more was recorded that he came in contact. Most of the time, this particular pericope is about Ascension Sunday, but I want to focus more on verse 8, where really rubber hit the road. I have anointed you to preach the gospel and to spread to all places. This is the mission we have today. It's not about evangelism or how we do it, but we are expressing ourselves to be a testimony to a world that needs to know that there is hope, there is encouragement. Let me take a sidebar here. Harrisburg, you are a great church to have opportunity. On next Sunday, we will receive at least 10 members into this congregation. That's a blessing. But if it's a blessing if we don't embrace them and the gifts they bring to use not in here, I'm not so concerned about numeric growth. It's about spiritual growth. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples is this is their actions to take, to spread the gospel. This is the whole theme of the book of Acts. How do we spread the gospel in this day and time when so many things are going on in our world? It just happened overnight. The Bible is loaded with many stories of those who have been called by God for his purpose and his will. And many of us, you and I, are called to a purpose and what he calls us to do, that he designed it just for you. And no matter how frightening it may be, we're in good company. When we think about the matriarch Moses over in Exodus 3 and 4 when he's a renegade on the run and all of a sudden meet up with Jesus in the Midian desert and he sees a bush that was not consumed. And he didn't, Jesus did not speak to them through that bush until he got his attention and turned to the side. Can you imagine the news of getting going back to tell Pharaoh to let my people go? He's probably shaking his boots. But he went. He knew it was ordered by God to lead his people out of bondage. And then we look over at poor little Gideon in the book of Judges, chapter 6. And he was in the wine press, hiding from the Midianites, scared to be under attack. But yet still, God spoke to him and had the nerve to call him man of valor. If you're hiding, how can you be a man of valor? He was scared. But when God spoke to him and allowed him to go up against the Midianites, and not only that, he told him, say, look, Gideon, you got too many to go up against them. You're talking about 300 men. And all of a sudden, he cuts his army down to 30. Then he say, the ones who lap like dogs, those are the ones you're going to take into battle? Those odds don't look good. But Gideon went on anyway from man of valley and hiding to what God has called him to do. Come here, brother Joshua. My servant Moses is dead. I need someone to lead them into the promised land. But it can't be Moses. It's got to be you. And sometimes God dropped the mantle on you to do a specific thing for a specific work. And if you don't realize that's God's doing, then you need to listen to him closely. Joshua, you're going to lead them into the promised land. Joshua watched how the people treated Moses. Why do I want to follow a man like that? But Joshua did anyway. Joshua was equipped because of God's doing. Joshua was assured that wherever he go, God will be with him. 
And I don't know about you, I look over the years, I, I'm trying to figure out why our churches have gotten so stagnated to believe in we're okay, you okay. No, there are people waiting for you to show them. You don't have to have a call around your neck. You don't have to preach from a pulpit, but if you're a child of God, you must preach Christ and being crucified. And greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Somebody need to hear from you. Somebody need to know that whatever I'm going through is only temporary and God is able to move us in a mighty way. Verse 8 is the power verse. Listen to these words again. There's something before he started off with, but. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Anything in our power is just going to fall short of the mark. We can have the best programs, the best testimony, the best worship, but if the Holy Spirit is not in it, we're just wasting our time. It's dangerous. He said, then will come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I'm not just talking about Harrisburg, North Carolina, or Concord, or Charlotte. Somebody need to know that the gospel is real and the Holy Spirit is with you. We can't do it in our own strength. Harrisburg is too many things we have to do. What am I trying to say? God rules every situation location, and relationship in whatever is called for us to follow. Don't ever get so big that you think that it's all about ego, about you. As I said this morning, have a wonderful staff that tolerate me and we tolerate each other, but we try to do the best we can. It takes team effort to my leaders this morning. It takes more than just leading, but you have to lead by example. People will see the Christ in you. It takes time out to be fervent in prayer, fasting, asking God, what's next, Lord? After Easter, it seemed like things just die down. And even every Sunday, I grace this desk, I come trembling to deliver a word that's too rich for me. This is the only book that you can read over and over again and never master it because it's rich. And even when you get through preaching it, you still haven't done a good service to it. But the testimony you give to somebody of what God has done for you. Now, look at it. We're in the same crowd with disciples. Look what happened in the text here. We sit there in verse 6. It says, the disciple asks, are you going to restore the kingdom now, Jesus? They were still looking in the past. And too many times, Jesus came with a rebuttal that set them straight. Jesus said, it's not for you to know. Their minds are still thinking about political independence, about setting up shop on this earth. They didn't understand that after the day of Pentecost, that's when it's time to start getting working, to lead the fire that God had came from and who he died for. But verse 7, he tells them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates. And the disciples wanted Jesus to tell them when he was going to return. Now, why is that important? Listen to me. If you don't hear nothing else, listen to me tonight, today. He is coming back, and too many churches get stagnated and get settled in their ways where they're not expecting him to return. He may come today. Will you be ready? The church sometimes act like it's way off that Jesus is going to return. We don't know the day, and we don't know the hour. So we do the work while it's day so that when he does return, we can hear those words say, well done. Or hear those words, bless you, because we got work to do. But he gave them the nugget of the whole text in verse 8 when he said the ends of the earth. What do you mean by the ends of the earth? He's not like talking about locality. He's saying anyone you come in contact with on your job, in your neighborhood, or at the grocery store, or wherever those places you don't want anybody to see you at. Don't make me go there. They're there waiting for you. And here they are watching Jesus as a cloud comes and he goes up behind the clouds. 
And the angel say, why are y'all staring at him going up? Your work is down here because he's coming back the same way he left here. And they're in amazement gaze. Did he not get the memo or the teachings all that time walking with him? That he said these things? And if you look at the history of time won't allow me, each one of those disciples, martyrs, the kinds of ways that they were they was, uh, crucified. Some of them were crucified horribly for God. And I asked the question today, what is holding you back from your fears for trying something new or looking for God to do something good? I don't know about you, but I look for God to do something new every day. Well, he does do some day to give you a bright sunshine and those things, but do something every day. When we come to church, we should come expecting God to do something that we won't leave here the same way we came. But knowing that we have the assurance that while we're trying to work it out, he's already figured it out. So let me get these things I've pulled from this text that I think we should be very much aware of. What is incredibly dangerous is how quickly we forget God and how fast our allegiance and our purposes are always plans to deal for us. How often we leave God out the equation or seek him last. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added. It's incredibly dangerous when we allow ourselves to be like the world, self-preservation is the first law of nature. I love the ministries that you're doing here. I love the ministry that all these churches are reaching out to do. The rise gets hungry. I'm looking for an exciting time. For there are those who we, some of them we know, don't even have the Maslow, Maslow heart of needs, food, clothing, and shelter. And they're living day to day. And I do believe that whom he bless, we have a blessing to be a blessing to others. So as, as fast as we have our allegiance to what we want to do, that's why Paul says, I must decrease so that he can increase. It's not about us all the time. We convince ourselves that we are wiser, stronger, and more righteous than we really are at times. And therefore, we're stepping in a dangerous ground. Many pastors, many colleagues have invested in me. I look at some of my father in the ministry who will let me know when I'm going down the wrong path. I have colleagues that keep me accountable. How much praying are you doing? Are you studying? How are you treating your spouse? You can't get through this world by yourself. You're going to need to build something around you. Even Jesus had the inner circle around him. Peter, James, and John. Because there are some you can't tell everybody because they'll be in the Harrisburg News the next day. But you got to have that inner circle. Somebody that give you that support. Thank God for them. One of my prime mentors that I had the privilege of eulogizing the last pastor in this district, this conference, from the central jurisdiction. And I was privileged and honored to eulogize him. I don't have time, so you know what the central jurisdiction was, a separation of African-American pastors and white pastors. He was the last one. And it was just an honor and privilege for his family to call me. It wasn't because of me. It because of what he invested in me. If someone has invested in you, and me also. Pass it on. Let me give you another one. Only grace can work to remind us that faith in God is a resting place. And if we trust anything else, it's like stepping in a minefield. We must be cautious of the faith in God is a resting place. That's the way we get our rest when the world beat us up. Where do you go when the world beats you up or doors that you thought should open up or close? Where do you go? Find you a resting place. And that's only when you can get along with God. I understand why 
David was out there saying, the Lord is my shepherd. When you look at some of the Psalms, you understand why they was writing those Psalms and what they were going through. But you got to find you a resting place. Even during the day, you need some place to go. Go to a park and just sit by yourself and just, just preach yourself happy. Sometime I used to be so glad my wife used to get so upset at me before I was appointed D. She said, I'd be glad when you get to church because I'm tired of him preaching to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's when God has done something that you want to pass along. I wouldn't choose any other occupation, but not occupation, vocation, but what I'm doing now. Can you say the same thing? Are you at peace where you are? Because if you don't have rest in God. It's like stepping in a minefield any day. And finally, it's a grace and grace alone that empowers you to follow and do what God has called you to do. That's why Jesus oppressed upon them, you stay here. Don't you go anywhere. Stay here until you endure with the Holy Spirit because you can't do nothing in your own strength. Stay right here. And that's what enabled the apostles to do their work, and that's the only thing going will Help us to do what God has called us to. Let me wrap this up. One of my favorite authors, Oswald Chambers, he penned these words by saying, if you're going to be used by God, he would take you through a multitude of experiences that are not meant for you at all. They are meant to make you useful in his hands. Did you get that? Every circumstance, situation, things you go through, he's equipping you to be not disappointed, but to use in his hands. Let me break it down because the morning church, morning service, they made me work at this. Those who ride horses. They put the bridle in the horse's mouth so they can control, so it won't go all over the place. God wants to be able to have you in his hands and do the work he's called you to do, and the only way you can do it is by his control. I know some of you don't like being controlled. I understand. I get it. Sometimes I get mad at him. But does it make a difference? Probably not. He probably say laugh and go on. So this is what he's talking about. Oswald Chambers is right. Everything you go through, Every circumstance, every situation is only being used to mold you, to be used in his hand. That's why I love Psalm 34. Reminds us that David said, I will bless the Lord at all times, not when I feel like it, not when things are going well. I will bless the Lord all the time. His praise will continually be on my mouth, no matter what I'm going through. Can you say that as a Christian? Because somebody is watching you. And how can you tell what God could do if you don't go through anything? Go back to my favorite author, Paul, in Philippians 2 and 17. Was my mantra when I went in ministry. Paul said, I'm being poured out. That's a living sacrifice. If you're going to follow this Jesus, you're being poured out as a living sacrifice that he may get the glory. That's what we are here for. I'm done. If you don't understand that, we got to go back to Bible 101. But we all are here for his purpose. Harrisburg, I'm going to be honest with you. Eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And man, none of you have conceived in your hearts and mind what God wants to do with this church. And I do believe it's going to shock a lot of you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say amen. amen. Now, y'all get a treat because the last time, this, the first service this morning, by the time I finish, how many have a smart watch? It's not so smart, because you know what it told me when I got through? You're through with your workout? <laughs> Everybody 
that size of this hoop. So, hey, it's all good. Preaching to strangers. You don't know whoever you come in contact with this week that may need a word from you or just a word of encouragement. We all in this together. Thank God for my staff. Thank God for this church. Thank God for all the ministries that are now and to come. Let us stand as we have our last song. But before I do, the invitation extended to any man, woman, boy, or girl who have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal savior. Salvation is a gift of God. And we have the assurance and know that if what come may, we know that we'll be with him. Or maybe somebody's looking for a church home. I've never seen a soldier without a station, learning and growing in Christ. Our ushers will get the information from you. And I ask that you pray for one another. Y'all look good here, but pray for one another. If you don't have anybody to pray for, pray for me. <laughs> I'll take all the prayers we got. So we're so grateful. Open my eyes. Why? grateful for this mountain of privilege you call you God the Lord of our lives open our eyes oh God in our daily walk as we see your people the needs maybe a word of encouragement maybe words to give them the assurance that it's gonna be all right and we lift up all of those who are in the hospitals and the nursing homes and it's those who may just listen by the sound of my voice let them know, God, that you are ever-present help in the time of every situation and circumstance. Now may the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in each and every one of us as we part from this place but never from your presence. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, let the church say, Amen. Amen. Amen.